OK, I'm told that I'm live now. Um, I hope people are tuning in right now. Hope you're able to see the screen and myself. OK, we have uh, quite a bit of material to go through. Um, hopefully I, I don't have to go too fast to get it all in. Um, but uh, I'm going to drag my feet just a couple of extra seconds here. Uh, it was suggested that I just make sure that everybody has the opportunity to uh, basically uh, tune in. So um, just take a minute to introduce myself. My name is Marty Natchel. I've been involved in the craft beer industry at some level or another for the past 30 years or so. In fact, it wasn't even called craft beer when I was first <laughs> getting into it. They call it uh, micro brewing back then. But anyway, um, today's uh, presentation is about judging. This is one of the things I've been very passionate about for the past 30 years or so. I've been in the BJCP almost since its inception in 19, well, it was conceived in 85. I tested in at, uh, in 1986. I've been involved in the program since. Um, I've gone on to judge at the Great American Beer Festival, the World Beer Cup, FOBAB, um, I have judged out of country here, there, and everywhere. But anyway, uh, so I think I'm going to go ahead and get started officially. Welcome, everybody. Um, I hope all of you are here with the intent of either A, becoming a judge, or B, uh, becoming a better judge, if you already are one. And that's the whole idea. Um, we call this program How to Judge Beer Like a Pro, but I actually uh, I like to have a secondary subject here and it's the elements of effective beer evaluation that's really what i'm going to be presenting today is different ways that you can utilize your skills and and uh different things that you can do to become a better judge all right so i'm going to start with a couple of softball questions and uh, you know keep in mind that i can't see you guys so when i ask this question how many of you like to drink beer I'm going to assume that pretty much 100% of you, if you don't have your hand physically in the air, it's at least in the air in your head, okay? So when I ask how many of you like to drink beer, you're all beer drinkers, okay? Now, the second question, just as important, how many of you are beer judges? Now, I imagine, imagine that even though, again, I can't see you, I imagine that many of you have also dropped your hand because you no longer think of yourself as a judge which in truth, you all are beer judges. If you're a beer drinker, you are already a beer judge. You may not realize it, but you are. Um, so what is the difference? Well, here's how we uh, hash it out. Those who are not trained beer evaluators, you're judging by a consumerist form of evaluation that we call hedonic judging, okay? Hedonic, the word hedonic is based on the Greek word hedonism which is defined as the pursuit of pleasure. So therefore, consumers ask themselves the questions, does this beer bring me pleasure? And by the way, like I said, this is the root of consumerism. It's not just about beer, it's about anything. It's about food, it's about clothing, it's about cars, it's about people even. You ask yourself, do these things bring me pleasure? And when we're talking about beer, you're saying, does beer bring me pleasure? That's the hedonic way of judging. So it's fair to say that hedonic judging is subjective, it's opinionated, and it's even emotional. I don't know if you, you probably know somebody, you've met somebody somewhere along the line that drinks nothing but Budweiser, drinks nothing but Blue Moon. These people have an emotional attachment to their beer. It's not necessarily rational, but nevertheless, let's take a look at how, oh, by the way, hedonic judging is also most of what you find on the online beer rating forums. Uh, most of the folks who populate the Rate Beer and Beer Advocate and Untapped, they are judging hedonically for the most part. They are not critical judges. So let's take a look at the difference between hedonic beer evaluation and critical beer evaluation. When we talk about critical beer evaluation, the critique is based on information, primarily facts and statistics. And this is what is provided to us through uh, beer, uh, beer style guidelines. We'll talk about that in a little while. So beer evaluators ask themselves the question, is this beer 
proper or correct. It has nothing to do with opinions or biases, okay? So it's fair to say that critical judging is objective as opposed to subjective. It's open-minded as opposed to opinionated, and it's impassive as opposed to emotional. So you really don't have feelings about the beer, okay? So in a professional setting, critical beer evaluation must always supersede hedonic beer evaluation. In other words, when you're entering the judging room, it's imperative that you leave your opinions and your biases and your feelings at the door. They have no place at the judging table. So when you sit down at that judging table, you should have the thought process in your head. You're actually gonna be judging every single beer in front of you through a two-part beer evaluation process. Now, you don't, you don't actually have to run it through your head, part one, part two. This can all happen simultaneous, but simultaneously, but essentially, you are answering these two questions. Question number one, is this beer without flaws? You want to assess the beer and find out whether or not it has a flaw of one type or another or multiple flaws. And the second part of the two-part evaluation process is you have to determine whether the beer is a good representation of its style. Remember that beers really aren't competing against one another. Beers are competing against the style guidelines, okay? That's what's important. And in the end, the one beer that most closely matches the beer style guidelines is going to be the winner, okay? So here's that two-part evaluation process. For part one, you have to be able to find and identify faults in beer. It's not enough to simply pick up a glass of beer and smell it and taste it and say, ooh, that smells funny or that tastes weird. That's not enough. You need to have the confidence to declare this beer is oxidized or this beer is light struck, you know, skunky. Um, so those are the things you have to work on identifying faults in beer. And then part two, you have to have familiarity with various beer styles. That doesn't mean you have to commit everything in the beer style guidelines to memory. That's virtually impossible. But you do, or you should, have tasted at least every single beer style that exists. And by the way, there are well over 100 different beer styles in the world, which means you should have tasted at least one exemplar from each style to have that familiarity with them. When it comes to the actual judging table, the beer style guidelines are any responsible um, a uh, competition director is going to have the beer style guidelines handy for you to read at the table. So don't worry about that part. Again, don't need to memorize them, but you do need to have familiarity. So to be a good and effective beer judge, these are the two things you need to work on most. You need to study off aromas and flavors, and you need to study beer styles. For both of these, it comes down to practice, practice, and more practice. It takes months, if not years, to be a good and effective beer judge. One of the ways to become familiar with off aromas and flavors is to get into a structured situation. And what I mean by that is that you can literally trip across these off aromas and flavors simply by buying commercial beer or maybe homebrew. And you're going to find the occasional skunky beer, and you're going to find the occasional DMS, and you're going to find the occasional oxidized beer. But it's, you know, you're, like I said, you're tripping across them. If you want a good structured means of learning about off aromas and flavors, then you can buy these products and use them. Now, keeping in mind, these are not inexpensive. Um, you might want to arrange with uh, fellow beer lovers or fellow home brewers, somebody in a local beer club or home brewing club. Uh, to share the expenses for these. Now, on the left hand of the screen, what you're seeing is the um, what we call slants. These are from the Siebel Institute here in Chicago, as a matter of fact. Um, these are something you can go online and purchase from Siebel. They're, again, they're not inexpensive. Likewise, in the middle, what you're seeing is the package available through Cicerone, and Cicerone does have its own educational component to this. You can buy these off flavors that you see in the picture. And part of that is to get an online uh, tutorial with somebody from Cicerone. 
And lastly, on the right hand of your screen, this is another company out of the UK. It's called Aroxa. That's A-R-O-X-A. -A. Um, what's interesting is you see that those are capsules there where the Siebel and Cicerone products are liquids that are mixed into beers. The Aroxa products are actually in powdered form. So you have to break open the little capsule and stir it into the beer. Um, my only uh, personal uh, experience with the Aroxa products was last year when I was in um, Amsterdam working with the Heineken folks on beer training. We got to uh, try some of these capsules. But um, otherwise, uh, like I said, you can buy any one of these products online, but you'll probably want to share the expenses with someone else. Likewise, if you have a friend or two that homebrew, uh, it's not unusual for a homebrew to go bad. And um, so, yeah, you find somebody that has homebrew with issues and you can learn from their mistakes, essentially. So I've talked about beer style guidelines quite a bit so far. Um, the beer style guidelines that I'm referring to come to us here in the United States basically from two different sources. What you see on the left hand of the screen is the Brewers Association. That's the trade organization located in Boulder, Colorado. They uh, represent many, many of our craft brewers across the country. Um, they also, they're the ones responsible for putting on the Great American Beer Festival every year and the World Beer Cup every other year. And for those two major competitions, they put together these guidelines for all the different beer styles. Um, as of 2018, I think they had 160 different beer styles represented in their guidelines, okay? On the right hand of the screen, you'll see the logo for the BJCP or Beer Judge Certification Program. As I mentioned earlier, they've been around since 1985. They also have their own guidelines that are available to anybody simply by going to bjcp.org. And um, many competitions uh, around the world, specifically in Mexico and South America, they use the BJCP guidelines. And by the way, anybody with a smartphone can go to your app store and download the BJCP uh, beer style guidelines to your phone and it costs you nothing. Just make sure you get the 2015 version uh, not any earlier. Uh, 2015 is actually the most recent. It should be changing over soon or so I'm told. And probably one of the best things you can do for yourself as a, a judge looking for improvement is to sit down with those guidelines and purchase commercial examples of as many different beer styles as you can. If you are able to read the words and taste the beer at the same time, there is no more effective way to learning about beer styles and to setting all of that information in your head. It's what we call sensory memory. The more you taste something and the more you attach it to the, the text about the beers. We talk, you know, the guidelines talks about the aroma, the flavor, the mouthfeel. Talks about with regards to BJCP, they include things like history and ingredients. And one of the most important things the BJCP includes in their guidelines is that they provide commercial examples of different beer styles. So if you're wanting to learn about Kolsch beer, for instance, from Germany, you look under the beer style guidelines under commercial examples, and they'll probably tell you uh, Gaffel or uh, PJ Fru, both from the town of Cologne in Germany. And so those are the beers you're going to want to seek out to sit down and taste along with the the guidelines. Um, like I said, no better way to learn. So let's transition over just a little bit. Um, the type of evaluations that we do as beer judges, it's called, it's considered organoleptic testing, okay? Organoleptic testing is the analysis of products and materials by means of the sense organs, including sight, smell, taste, and touch. Organoleptic testing is typically only used in cases where more objective scientific methods of testing are not available. Until scientists actually invent a computer or a robot that can smell and taste as efficiently as human beings, we are going to continue to rely on human beings for this organoleptic testing. Now, having said that, note that some of the scientific, scientific testing already has been done on beer. For example, 
the SRMs, which refer to color, the IBUs, which refer to bitterness, and the ABV, which refers to alcohol content. These are the three basic parameters of all beer styles, and those are indeed scientifically measurable. So with regards to organoleptic testing, let's talk about the human physiology. What we wanna get involved in addition to our eyes is the nose, the tongue, the palate, and the retronasal passage. On the assumption that you guys all know the first three, I'm going to move along to the retronasal passage. And this is that passageway in the back of your neck or the back of your throat, I should say, in your neck. It goes from the back of your uh, mouth or throat up into your nasal passage. It's about two to three inches in length. Now, when we talk about smelling something, we talk about the direct or orthonasal way, whether it's a bouquet of flowers or a glass of beer, we think of it as inbound, one way only. And what that does is it causes the volatile odorants to pass by the olfactory receptor, which by the way is way high in the nasal cavity. It's almost behind our eyeballs. So the volatile odorants pass through, pass by the olfactory receptors and down into our lungs, all right? A lot of people are not aware that there is also a reverse way to smell, and that's called indirect or retronasal way. Essentially, after you take a sip of beer, if you immediately exhale through your nose, all the volatile odorants that are still trapped in your retronasal passage, they are forced back out through your nasal cavity, past the olfactory receptors, so you actually get to smell your beer twice. One coming, one going, okay? It's a very effective process. It works very well. So to underscore the importance of smell to the ability to taste, they are very, very closely connected. Without the sense of smell, the sense of taste is wasted. Um, this is a, a cool little test you can try on yourself. You see there in the background, there are jelly beans. This is something that my science teacher did when I was in grade school. Um, he came to, to class with a bowl of, of jelly beans, and he had us all pick out our favorite, uh, favorite flavor. And what he did is he had us hold our nose literally, quite literally with our thumb and finger, pop the jelly bean in, the, in our mouths, chew it up to the point where we're almost ready to swallow, and then as we swallow, release our nose. And there's, a, there, there's an immediate burst of flavor on your palate. And that is a way to underscore the importance of smell to our sense of taste. Again, it's something you could try at home. So uh, it needs to be said that there are per people who walk among us who are considered non-smellers or super smellers. There are maladies that affect people for good and for bad that may make them either better judges or not so good judges. And it's something you might have to learn about yourself. There's something called anosmia, which is the lack of sense of smell. Hyposmia, which is a decreased ability to smell. And I actually worked with a person who had, he suffered a head injury when he was young. And he actually has a decreased ability to smell because of that. Uh, there's hyperosmia, which is an increased ability to smell. So just the opposite. And there's specific anosmia, which is anosmic for a specific smell. In other words, a person can smell 99% of all the aromas there is there are in the world and yet be able to miss one. Specific anosmia. Likewise, there are non-tasters and super tasters. Some of you may be afflicted with these situations. Ajusia is the lack of taste sensation. Hypojusia is the diminished taste sensation. Disjusia is the altered taste sensation. Familial Dysautonomia is a rare condition that fails to recognize sweet sensation, and selective bli taste blindness is a very high threshold for bitter taste. So depending on your situation, you may or may not have, as the average person does not, but there are people who do have them. And I would like to mention, by the way, since I am now getting of advanced age, it's a fact that as we age, we do lose some of our senses, specifically our sense of smell, and our sense of taste. So it's something to be aware of as we age. Um, speaking of the non-tasters and the super tasters, roughly one quarter of all human beings are considered super tasters. 
while another quarter are considered non-tasters. So that means 25% of everybody you know is one or the other. Super tasters have more taste buds than the average person. Non-tasters have fewer taste buds, and you might be able to identify yourself as such if you have a very high tolerance of bitterness or spicy foods. So be aware of that. Um, this is something, just a quick comment. This is a little bit of a, a side note here. For any one of you who owns a brewery or works at a brewery or is affiliated with the brewery in some way, this is a great way for breweries that have more than just a handful of employees to utilize their workforce for good. Um, they can put together brewery sensory panels by having your brewery personnel actually run through a verification of their sensory skills. You can use these people who are already on the payroll to help you make better beer. Uh, it doesn't have to be the brewer. It doesn't have to be workers in the brew house. It can be your, your marketing team. It can be your sales team. It can be your administrative people. Who knows? The lady answering the phone up in the front office might be a great, it might be a super taster. You never know. So give, give that some thought. Uh, back to the program. Um, everyone should be aware that there is something called blind spots. Different people have different sensitivity levels or thresholds to different taste and smell stimuli. Not all of us are built the same. One might have difficulty detecting a specific aroma or flavor. Um, so it's it's imperative that you learn if you have blind spots and if you do, how to work around them. Also be aware of these issues that can plague uh, uh, judges as well. Everyone experiences fatigue at some point in time. It could be physical fatigue from not getting enough sleep, or it can be palate fatigue from simply consuming too much beer. When I first started as a beer judge, I didn't realize that you can't take big sips or even gulps of beer, especially if it was a beer that I was enjoying, right? So my, my hint to you is take smaller sips and take fewer sips. Usually beers are served in the three to four ounce range. I make a point of leaving about half of that in the cup when I'm done. I never, I, I try to never ever finish the beer in the cup, all right? There's also something called desensitization. This can happen both to our sense of taste and smell. Of course, it has a lot to do with the alcohol. Over time, the alcohol will deaden our taste buds. It will deaden our other senses, including taste and smell. So it's important to take breaks, drink water, Eat bland starch, uh, such as unsalted crackers, matzo bread, uh, cubed French bread, anything like that. And with regards to resetting the sense of smell, it could be as something as easy as sniffing our clothes, uh, sniffing our skin, sniffing the pen or pencil in our hand, anything like that. Something to reset your sense of smell. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, environment and continuity. And so what we need as far as environment, it's very important that where the judging takes place be well lit. It doesn't matter if it's incandescent lighting, fluorescent lighting, sunlight, as long as it's diffused, you don't want to have it directly on you. Um, the temperature in the room should be regulated, uh, you know, thermostatically, hopefully. Um, you don't want a room that's too warm. You don't want a room that's too cold, although cool is preferred over warm. You don't want it to have any distractions. You don't want music playing in the background. You don't want loud conversations or laughter. You don't want banging or clanging of any kind of uh, pots and pans, anything like that. You want it to be odor free. You don't want musty mustiness or mildew or pets or food or bathroom odors anywhere nearby. So keep all of that in mind. All of those are distractions. With regards to continuity, um, item number one would be the judging environment. You want continuity everywhere the judging takes place if there are different rooms. So everything that was on the previous slide, you want that to be continuous from room to room. Beer serving temperature, it's very important to can keep continuity in beer serving temperature. It's not fair to the beer or to the brewer when you serve one beer at a palate numbing 38 degrees, and then you serve the next beer at a very pleasant 45 degrees and you serve another beer at a, a very unpalatable room temperature. You have to find that, that sweet spot and serve all the beers at the same level. 
Uh, lastly, there is glassware. All the glasses should be the same, proper size and shape. They should be beer clean, and I hope you guys all know what this means. I don't have time to get into it now. And lastly, they should be odor free. I remember a competition in the early days, 20, 30 years ago. The competition organizers purchased many sleeves of these cheap plastic glasses. And of course, they all smelled like cheap plastic glasses. That was not a fun competition to judge. So let's talk a little bit about tasting order. We are always reminded at the uh, GABF and WBC World Beer Cup to randomize the sampling order to avoid something called serial position effect. This is very important to avoid this, and here's why. Something called primacy and recency. Scientists have figured out that we tend to remember best that which comes first. In other words, the very beer, first beer tasted, and that phenomenon is known as primacy. Uh, we also tend to remember second best that which comes last or the most recently tasted beer. That's why they call it recency. So we remember beer number one, the best. We remember the last beer, second best. And we tend to remember least all of those that come in the middle. So if you're tasting a flight of 10 beers, you remember beer number one and beer number 10. Beers number two through eight, I don't know. Kind of tough on those guys. That's why it's important to randomize your glasses so not all of the beer judges judging the same flight are judging the beers in the same order. This is very important. It's also important to be mindful of these other scoring uh, problems that can occur. Central scoring is when judges assign scores in a narrower range as palate fatigue causes the beers to taste more and more similar over time. If you're judging something, let's say, for instance, I mentioned Kolsch beers before. Kolsch beers have a very narrow flavor profile. So there's not a lot of differences between the beers, if they're, assuming they're all well-made. It becomes very difficult to, to uh, as a beer evaluator, to give the different scores to each beer. Um, extreme scoring. Judges may assign one or two beers much higher scores than the other beers because they stand out as being flavorful. Imagine tasting a flight of Czech Pilsners. And let's say that one of those beers has a higher IBU content than all the rest of the beers. And let's say another one of those beers has a little bit of background diacetyl in it. You can't really discern that there's a lot of diacetyl in there enough to flag it. Or you can't discern that one of the beers has a higher IBU rating. You just know that those two beers taste a little bit differently from all the rest. So they're going to stand out, and thus they may be scored better by you because they are perceived as being more flavorful. Now, there's also something called proximity scoring. This is where judges may assign scores that are too high to a beer that follows a poor example of the style. Let's say you're judging a, a flight of 10 beers. You get to beer number six, and it's it's pretty bad. It's It's poorly made. It has issues, and you just finish up and get it out of the way, and you move on to beer number seven. And that beer is objectively average. However, because it came after beer number six, which pretty much sucked, uh, you're going to think, wow, this is pretty good. So you give it a little higher score than you might have otherwise, proximity scoring. Then last, uh, last but not least, there's drift scoring. Judges may assign progressively lower or higher scores to beers as time progresses simply because the alcohol is setting in, fatigue is setting in, you're not focusing as, as good as you could or should be, so your scores start to drift either higher or lower within the flight. I always recommend that, especially when you're doing a larger flight, it may take a while to get through all of those, let's say 10 beers. Uh, we know that time changes temperature, and temperature changes the perception of aroma and taste. So if time or palate fatigue don't allow a retaste of all 10 beers, then at least give each beer a re-smell. Because over time, as the beer warms up, it opens up and it releases more of what that beer has for good and for bad. So you may find yourself, you may actually find something in those beers a half hour down line, an hour down line that you did not upon initial tasting. So we're going to talk briefly about beer score sheets and scoring notes. 
Um, this is, for, for those of you who have never seen this before, this is a standard BJCP score sheet. I'm going to run through this relatively quickly. Um, this is information about the judge. This is information about the beer. This is information more about the judge, about their rank, and any other um, uh, qualifications they may have. This whole list is a variety of different descriptors that you can simply check the box if you note that in a beer. Over here is the real guts of the uh, scoring sheet. You see that there are five different sections, aroma, appearance, flavor, mouthfeel, and overall impression. Room for you to write something about those things. And of course, the score, uh, uh, 0 to 12, 0 to 3, 0 to 20, 0 to 5, 0 to 10 for a possible total score of 0 to 50. Down here are some check boxes that honestly I don't find especially important to the uh, home brewer whose beer gets these scores. What I do find very important, and I will note it in this next slide, is what's called the scoring guide. I consider this probably the second most important part of this, uh, this score sheet because this is the information it contains. It basically lays out very clearly that beers within certain scoring ranges should have these attributes. And a good beer judge, simply with two or three sips, they should know already that a particular beer fits within one of these categories, whether it's fair, good, very good, excellent, outstanding, or whatever. And they should be able to establish that first and then go back and simply fill out the scores in a backwards manner. And this is what I call top-down versus bottom-up scoring. If you're starting at the top of the score sheet and working your way down, you may find that you get to the bottom and all of a sudden you realize, oh, geez, I gave that beer a 45. It's really not that good. So then you have to go backwards and start erasing what you wrote down and changing what you wrote and changing your score. It takes time. It takes effort. I contend that the bottom-up method of scoring is actually better and easier. It quickens the scoring process. It helps you to avoid erasures or changes, and you find agreement with fellow judges if you establish that bottom score first before moving on with the rest of the score sheet. Here's a quick look at um, what I call tasting notes from the World Beer Cup and the GABF. You notice that they are essentially uh, identical with exception to the logos in the upper left-hand corner and the name at the top there. Um, everything else is pretty much the same. Appearance, aroma, taste, mouthfeel, aftertaste, and finish, technical quality, style, and so on and so on. You'll notice what's missing when compared to the BJCP score sheet. Obviously, they're much smaller. They don't include any scoring. At the professional level, we don't score beers. We simply assess the beers critically, and then in discussion with fellow judges, we determine which beer deserves to be in first, second, and third, and so on. So these are simply called tasting notes, not scoring sheets. You'll also see that these use what's called sliders. This is a sliding scale. All you have to do is put a tick mark on these sliding scales. Rather than having to write anything, you just put a mark on those scales. It's much, much quicker. Here's a scoring sheet from the Festival of Wood and Barrel Aged Beer. You'll notice that this is also similar to the other score sheets in that they cover color and appearance, aroma, flavor, drink, balance, and drinkability, where it uh, is different, obviously, this is about barrel-aged beer, is there are sections with about wood character, barrel character, and for any beers that are sour or wild, there's room to assess the qualities of those beers down here. And lastly, to kind of catch up with everybody else who is using sliding scales, the BJCP instituted this. I believe it was in 2018 that they came out with this new provisional score sheet. And you can see that they have now included slider scales and they have reduced the area for writing because writing simply takes too much time. So all of this leads to what I call pacing because time is very critical. Beer flights can range from as few as four or five beers to as many as a dozen or more. It's important. This is something I do for myself, but I do recommend it for others too. 
I shoot for 10 minutes per beer. And when you extrapolate that out for every six beers that you evaluate, you need a full hour of beer evaluation. Now, that sounds like a lot of time, but it's really not. You'd be surprised how fast time goes. A flight of 10 beers requires one hour and 40 minutes to evaluate. And keep in mind that this is just the individual evaluation part. It does not include the time that is spent in discussion with your fellow judges, which also takes time. Sometimes it can go very fast when things are pretty obvious. Sometimes it can become very protracted. And I've even seen judges get into arguments. So anyway, don't be that guy. Be sure to watch your, your clock, time yourself, stay on track, and don't hold up the rest of your table because what can happen in larger competitions is by holding up your table, you are essentially holding up the other tables as well. Don't be that guy. So one of the ways that we can help ourselves in beer judging is by using beer judging tools. And I'm just going to cover three of them very briefly. There's the SRM color chart, the beer flavor wheel, and the beer flavor map. Uh, most of you, I, can, I would like to assume, have seen the SRM color chart, which we're looking at right now. The SRM chart goes from one to 40. When we're talking about cream ales and cultures, that's when we're down in the one, two, three range. When we're talking about imperial stouts and robust porters, we're looking at the 38, 39, 40 range, and every other beer falls somewhere on this color spectrum. So when we talk about SRM number, we can uh, associate that with a specific color on this scale. And it's, there's nothing wrong with using this during judging, by the way. Uh, the beer wheel, this was created back in the 1970s by Dr. Morton Mailgard. It's called the beer wheel, and what you'll see is there are three concentric circles in this beer wheel. It's simply to help judges who can't come up with the proper descriptors. They know they're smelling something, they know they're tasting something, but they can't quite put their finger on it. This is one way to help. There's like 160 some odd descriptors on this beer flavor wheel. And again, there's nothing wrong with using this wheel at the judging table. More recently, however, that beer flavor wheel is being um, uh, being uh, replaced by something called the beer flavor map. This was created, I believe, about three to four years ago. It's relatively new. Um, judges have found that it's very, very effective, even more so than the beer flavor wheel. It's color coded here. You see it's got things for mouthfeel, which the wheel did not. It's got many, many more descriptors for the various aromas and flavors that you will find in beer. So this has found a home in the beer judging community. Last but not least, it's important that you uh, uh, exercise professional courtesy at the table. Beer judges are people who take their, uh, I don't want to call it a profession because it's not really, it's an avocation, but it's a very serious one. People who smoke or vape should not do either before or during uh, judging sessions. Um, no colognes or perfumes should be worn. Um, that's telling me that I am out of time, so I'm speeding up here. Uh, no colognes or perfumes should be worn on judging day. Uh, it's recommended that, that you use unscented soaps and shampoos. Um, when you're at the judging table, there should be no unnecessarily loud discussion or laughter during judging because that can be very distracting. Um, it's very unprofessional to guess beer brands as you're judging them. It's also very unprofessional to give gratuitous criticisms of the beers or the brewers, so you should refrain from that. And there should be no cell phone use at the table. GABF and WBC both make it very clear that if you're caught using your phone at the table for whatever reason, you will be removed from the judge room for the remainder of that session. Okay? So basically, don't do it. Cheers to all. Thank you very much for tuning in. And uh, that is it for this session. So let's go ahead. I've got a couple minutes left. I'm going to see if we have any questions. Um, if any of you have questions, now would be the time to go ahead and post them in the chat. I'll be more than happy to address them as they come in. Any questions at all, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Just real quickly, I actually meant to show this before while I was 
talking about the uh, scoring sheets and the uh, uh, judge tasting notes, you see how relatively small these are. Regular BJCP scoring sheets are considerably larger, regular 8 by 11 format, and these are re re relatively small. Um, and you just tear these out and submit them. And th this is what gets turned back to the brewers when they submit uh, beers to the competition. Another thing that I was going to show just for fun was that um, when I mentioned sitting down with beers and reviewing them with the uh, beer style guidelines at your disposal, tasting them and reading them at the same time, I just want to show you something. This is uh, something out of the archive. These notes date back to about 1984 or 85. These are my original scoring notes from way back when. Um, I used to go to the local liquor store and buy beers that I'd never tasted before. And I would sit down at my kitchen table with my, my notebook and pen or pencil. And I would sit down and, and, and studiously drink the beer, smell it and taste it and assess it according to the guidelines and write down my impressions of them. So these, these are now like 36 years old. I still have them and I still review them from time to time just for fun. But uh, let's see. Um, any questions? I know I covered a lot of ground in a relatively short period of time. I hope I didn't uh, rush anybody unnecessarily. But, uh, of course, you can always go back and review it if you can stand to see my face that long or hear my voice. But uh, hopefully this was helpful to those of you who want to become a judge or to those of you who want to improve on your, your judging abilities. So, a couple minutes left, I believe. Anybody has any questions? I'm just double checking on my time here. All right. I'm just going to stall another minute or two in case anybody has some last minute questions. All right. So it appears that uh, my time is now officially up. I will be signing out shortly, but before I do, I just want to say thank you for everyone who tuned in. I hope you got something out of this. I hope uh, you all become better judges. I hope to run across you someplace, sometime, at some beer event. Until then, 